This video looks at a recently published paper on the archive repository whose authors have derived analytical solutions that describe time-like and null geodesics in the Kerr space-time. Further to this, they have written a mathematical notebook that plots these solutions and which is freely available to the public. And the paper can be found here, so in the description of this video you'll have this link, and the mathematical notebook can be found here. Okay, that also contains a demo notebook and some other information. So their paper is here, um, uh, and that'll be in the description uh, below this video. This is what it looks like. Here are the three researchers, Adam Seaslick, Eva Huckman, and Patrick Muck. I hope I've pronounced those names correctly, and I apologise if I haven't. Um, and so they derive novel analytical solutions describing time-like and null geodesics in the Kerr space-time. Uh, their solutions are parameterized explicitly by constants of motion, the energy, the angular momentum, and the Carter constant, and initial coordinates. They also use um, a little-known result due to BM and Weierstrass regarding solutions of a certain class of ordinary differential equations. Well, what I'm going to do in this video, just have a brief look at the paper, uh, some examples of things to plot and uh, how to find the notebook online. So if you go here to this link here, you'll find the notebook. Uh, there's a demo notebook. Um, there's a file that supports the um, uh, notebook. And you can create, uh, using these two, you can create as many notebooks as you want. There's a bit of readme information here, and I'll show you a couple of things. Um, I'll show you the notebook that I've put together using the information I provided in the demo notebook. <coughs> and uh, one other thing. Now, there's some information about these files. You need to keep them together. Um, uh, okay, also provides general solutions of the Kerr geodesic equations in Boyer Lindquist coordinates. All throughout, we'll just be working in Boyer Lindquist coordinates. Just one thing. Now, a bit of advice use in Mathematica. To use the library in Mathematica, put this file, this one here, package file, in the same place as the notebook you are working on. Very important you do that. So when you load it, it knows where to find it and it can work. Um, and you uh, upload the following two commands, this one and this one, and I'll show you on my notebook how that works. You've got a demo notebook here to show you basic functions of the package, and then um, <clears throat> you can start working with it yourself, and trying different um, plots and different geodesics. All right, um, now just in relation, for instance, so I've created uh, this notebook here and this one, and it's this second one I'll upload to the notes section of this channel. Um, but notice I have this file together with um, my notebooks. So it's all in the one directory and I'll show you that shortly. Um, this is their paper here. I'll have that open shortly. Um, and it, it's what I'll do is briefly run through this paper now and then I'll look at my notebook. It's this one and just show you its use. Just point a couple of things out. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. Kerr geodesics in terms of Weierstrass elliptic functions. Researchers Adam Cheerslick, Searslick, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Eva Huckman and Patrick Muck. And it's a wonderful thing they've done because they've produced a mathematical notebook. Um, so not only have they derived uh, these novel solutions um, quite unique, which um, are, remain real. Uh, for all null and uh, time-like geodesics. As I put it, a novel set of analytical solutions describing time-like and null geodesics in the Kerr space-time. Um, a single set of formulas valid for all null and time-like geodesics, irrespective of their radial and polar type. I'll see what we mean by that shortly. Um, and they've been able to achieve that uniform using a, a little known result due to Beerman and Weierstrass regarding solutions of a certain class of ordinary differential equations. And the wonderful thing about this is that these solutions remain real uh, for all applications you can think of. Um, okay, so a bit, a bit of an introduction here to their paper, the background of texts and so on, and just uh, where everything in this field is in relation to the progress has been made over a number of decades. Um, now, <clears throat> here we go. 
So in this paper, they give exact solutions to the geodesic equations in occur space time. And they use that result from Beerman and Biostras, and we'll, we'll see that shortly. Okay, and they were able to find a single set of formulas valid for generic time-like and null geodesics that yield an explicitly real solution for arbitrary admissible initial data, such as position and uh, so on. Okay, so uh, position, energy, and so on. Okay, um, you know, it's all solutions. Okay, we go. Um, I think that, okay, now, that's the main, uh, the important thing here. Um, and then they've coded all this in Wolfram Mathematica notebooks, and that's how we'll finish up the video by having a look at um, how you can put those together. Anyway, they're going to use um, geometric units, um, speed of light and the gravitational constant set to one, and uh, the signature of the metric is minus plus plus plus. Euler Lindquist coordinates, TR theta phi, um, and the metric, metric uh, terms, components of the metric. Um, delta, of course, this, rho squared is this, usual. Now the uh, inner and outer event horizons can be found here as usual. Um, uh, angular momentum is characterized as J equals MA, not MAC. Um, what else is, okay, now time light and null geodesics can be expressed in the Hamiltonian form. Makes use of this. Um, the momentum here is being parameterized such that dx mu is d tau tilde. I'll get to d tau tilde shortly. Uh, the Hamiltonian given here is a function of uh, position and momentum. Uh, here, written in terms of the metric, and this, remember c is 1, so we're not going to have a, a, a c um, squared term there. Um, m is the, small m is the uh, mass of the particle, and the um, uh, four velocity gives us this. Now, delta will be 1 for time light geodesics, delta will be 0 for null geodesics. Uh, the momentum is usually P equals MU, but we've seen here that we can parameterize it such that it's, um, we can write it as dx mu d tau tilde. I've talked about that um, rescaling of coordinates in, in previous videos in this playlist, so I won't go into that again, but the proper time is um, the mass of the particle times tau tilde. So tau tilde used up here is the proper time divided by the mass of the particle. So it's just a rescaling. That's all it is. And you're going to see a bit of rescaling in this paper. It's a wonderful piece of work. Um, and then it, it results in this Mathematica notebook, which is just fantastic. And just for all the enthusiasts out there, just to play around with and have a go at and so on. It's just a wonderful thing if you've got Mathematica. Okay, so you've got some constants of motion, the Hamiltonian, the energy of the particle, total energy of the particle in its orbit, uh, the azimuthal component of angular momentum, okay, and there's also the Carter constant. So there's four constants of motion. And then uh, separation of variables in the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, uh, which um, then gives us these four equations here. Okay. Uh, the radial um, potential can be written as this. So this capital R as a function of small r is the radial potential. And this capital theta here as a function of small theta is the polar potential. Okay, so radial and polar potentials respectively. Um, the E r, E theta correspond to directions of motion in the r and theta respectively. Uh, and we'll see they can be plus or minus one. I'll come to that a little bit shortly. Uh, uh, the radial component of momentum is this object, the theta polar component of momentum is this one. Um, there's a convenient way to partially decouple the above equations, and that's introducing minnow time. I'll come to that a little bit later in the, we're just about to come to it shortly. It consists of reparameterizing geodesics so that, remember that reparameterizing uh, re I've been covering in the recent videos prior to this, but we can reparameterize rho squared dx mu d tau tilde as dx mu ds tilde. So so how, are t, how is tau tilde and s tilde related? This is minnow time, tau tilde is the integral zero to s tilde of rho squared ds, and we integrate that. And that gives us, um, that allows us to make this conversion here. We can rescale our time component so that we absorb this row squared business. 
and then that yields dr ds is this object here d theta ds d phi ds dt ds that's coordinate time t the by Lindquist coordinate time t here right, it's convenient now to work in these dimensionless rescale variables so for time like geodesics it define the dimensionless variables as the uh, spin parameter is the mass times the dimensionless spin parameter dimensionless uh, the alpha is a dimensionless spin parameter uh, t is m times capital t uh, r is m zeta e is m now remember this is the epsilon here is the energy parameter it's the total energy of the orbit divided by um, the energy of the particle um, in its rest frame far from the source uh, the Carter constant is this a rescaling the uh, Carter constant is a small kappa here but um, rescaled uh, the Carter constant divided by m squared m squared is this kappa as a methyl component is m times lambda z so lambda z is the as a methyl component of angular momentum divided by the product of the mass of the black hole and the mass of the particle now in addition the rescaled minnow time s is s tilde is one on m m that product one on m m uh, times s so there's a lot of rescaling here which reduces the equation to simpler analytical forms so a fair bit of that's gone on here and you can see that here and if you have a look here zeta is r on m and this gives us dimensionless quantities which are good to work with and then we can solve in these equations here which is what they do okay if you notice these you've got fourth order polynomials on the right here if you expand all these out you've got something in fourth order particularly here if you look at these the polar the radial and polar potentials expanding those out you're going to have fourth orders uh, at least in the uh, radial part anyway um okay uh energy parameter here the azimuthal component rescaled here the um kappa here and um okay then they look at different types of orbits i'm not going to go through all this in detail because there's quite a few pages here and uh, i want to get on to some other things to show you something um keep going here now there is this result from Beerman and Biastras. You can take a fourth order polynomial and a quartic polynomial and it has certain properties, certain invariants. G2 is this is an invariant, this is an invariant, and as a result, we can carry out this integral here, okay, resulting in this solution here. And this helps us in rewriting now the polar um, potential in this form here. And then become solvable and they've used this little known result to help them find solutions and they produce some wonderful things um, which they can then summarize in a mathematical notebook which is really it's a lot of fun to work with um uh, same here for the polar motion down here i'll move on now i'm not going into all the properties of it there's a bit here to read and so on i just want to get down now to some of the plots that we can do. Okay, there's a lot more goes on here, a lot of explanation. <clears throat> Properties of all that BM and biostrust result. Okay, time coordinate here too. Okay, what's well, now the implementation in Mathematica, and it is uh, wonderful. And that's what I want to get down to now. So I'll move on to that. Some examples. Okay, they give you some, you can try out some of these. As a starting point. I'm going to show you some others shortly, which is why I'm trying to make time now. Um, you can plot in the equatorial plane only if you choose. I'll show you that in the notebook I have. And you can plot in 3D as well. And that's the wonderful thing. Uh, you, you can plot in 3D for yourself and, and see the different types of orbits. Uh, I'll reproduce that one for you, among others. Um, but there's a range of different orbit types, you know, the transit, the flyby, plunge orbit, uh, bound orbits, and so on. So uh, we'll come down to that. There's, they give you a few examples here. I'll recreate this one for you as well. Um, okay. Now, next thing is, uh, where did I need to go? 
back here, didn't I? Oops, what have I done? Okay, so here's, um, uh, let me just op open the project. Okay, so here's the notebook. You're going to need to make sure this is set in, comma, this part here. So it calls up this file here. It contains all the information you need. Now, this is the um, phi zero. This is the initial angle in the phi uh, direction. Now, epsilon r is minus one means inwardly directed motion, and plus one is outwardly directed motion in the radial direction. R theta theta is your initial starting point. I'm going to set this example for you at 82. Now, eth, epsilon th, sorry, uh, plus one for the positive direction and the theta angle, minus one for motion in the negative direction. Okay, so that's theta moving in the negative direction if you put a minus here, otherwise it's theta moving in the positive direction. The initial angle theta is set at 0 0.85 radians. The energy parameter for the orbit, in this case, is square root of 1.1. The um, azimuthal component of angular momentum set at 1.5 units. This A here is actually referring to the dimensional spin parameter. Um, okay, and kappa is 12, delta is 1. Now, um, it's also you could have had with the kappa here, you could have had that um, uh, you can also replace with this with the parentheses, uh, and inside the parentheses have lambda minus um, epsilon here, the energy parameter, times um, A, okay, close the parentheses and square it. Now, I haven't shown you that here. Uh, I might do it later. And that will also give you the value of kappa as well. Okay, so that's substitution we've made before in solving previous equations, where we replace H minus A and C. If you look back over the previous videos I've done, it's the same thing. Okay, now we can plot this in the xy plane. They also provide you, you can plot it in the xz plane or you know the yz plane, it's up to you. I'm just going to do, I want to show you the two and that's plotting in the xy plane, projecting onto the xy plane here. Okay, so here's a plunge orbit. Love those plunge orbits. And here's a 3D plot. Okay, in round it spins before it eventually crosses the event horizon, and then that's it. Uh, just one thing I would like to point out. If you, uh, it takes me a little while to run. One of one of these takes me like 20, 30 minutes to run on this laptop. So, you know, it takes a bit of time, but, um, and that's just to do these two plots. Uh, one thing, just be careful here, when you set the parameter S, remember it's the time parameter. When you set that here, if, if you, uh, earlier this afternoon before I made this video, I went and set it to five. I should have known better because I spent a number of days doing this, but I set it to five. And so it came in here, it spun around, went inside the event horizon, then came back out and off it went. So just be a little bit selective and careful in selecting your S value. Don't force it to do things like uh, go into the event horizon, cross the event horizon, and then jump out of it again. I mean, that's obviously ridiculous. So you choose a suitable length. So by messing around with this, um, in the trial I had before this one, earlier this evening, I set it at 1.9 and it sort of it remained inside the outer event horizon. So that was good. But, you know, if you set it a bit more than 1.9, I think earlier I set it to 1.95 or something, you know, it's spinning around in there and wanting to come out again. And certainly earlier when I set it to five, earlier today, it went into the event horizon and then came back out again. So don't force uh, a nonsensical solution on it, okay? Be careful, be judicious in your choice of the time parameter there. Don't force it to do something that's not correct. So I'm playing around with it. I found 1.86 is fine. You can see it crosses the event horizon about here somewhere, near the horizontal axis, and you can see it's just inside. And that's it. It's entered the event horizon, end of story, okay? Uh, and then do the same here in the three-dimensional plot as well, so you don't get anything ridiculous. Just be aware of that. Be careful, cautious, and sensible in your choice, judicious in your choice of uh, uh, time frame there. All right, and let's go back. Okay, so some different ones here. You'll be able to follow those examples in the video, but if I, if I set to 0.33 radians, and the um, polar angle set to 0.85, 
and R, the distance set to uh, 82 units. Okay, so that's going to be that squared. And, you know what I mean? So here we go, starting out over here somewhere, way out over here. I did that deliberately. And then in it comes. Okay, and round into the event horizon. This one doesn't come out again, so that's great. Um, but I set that for lambda z is negative 0 0.05. Epsilon square root 30. Just try these different ones. Okay, here's a different one there. Here was a bound orbit. Uh, the only ones I'm showing today are time-like orbits. I'm, uh, orbits. I'm not showing any null geodesics. Um, otherwise, the video is going to get too long. I'm already up over 20 minutes as I speak now. Um, again, same thing. F is plus 1, so it's going to move in a positive theta direction. Okay, so that's downwards. And negative minus 1 would mean it would be moving in upwards direction. Uh, epsilon square is 0 0.95, the um, azimuthal component of angular momentum, three units here. Uh, I'll keep A and 0 0.8 for all of these, and delta is 1 for time-like. Delta is 0 would be null, and kappa is 12. And you can see here's the start point, and then round it goes. That's a bound orbit. Um, here's a, another bound orbit. This time I put F is minus 1. Okay, minus 1. And again, here we go, a little bit more complex. This is the XY plane on the left here. Here's the three-dimensional plot. Um, let's have a look at another one now. Put AR uh, at 20 now. F is plus one, pi on two. So it starts in the equatorial plane. Uh, the energy parameter square is 0 0.95. Um, positive one unit of azimuthal angular momentum. And uh, this is what we get in the XY plane. This wonderful orbit here. And then three-dimensionally, it looks like this. Let's have another look. Why not? I, I started to look for plunge orbits because I, um, I I just like the look of them. Anyway, so here's a plunge orbit. It starts in the equatorial plane. Theta is pi on 2. Um, and uh, phi is 0. So that was simple. R00 is 20. Initial starting point. You can see what some of these values are. Um, F is plus 1. Uh, so it's moving in the positive direction. Epsilon R is minus 1, so it's moving inwards, okay, which would make sense for a plunge orbit. Um, and what have we got here? We've got, um, so obviously, you know, you, you could have Epsilon R is plus 1 where it's moving out, so you might want to start very close near the event horizon and try to see if you can make it go out. I haven't tried any of those yet. Um, <clears throat> okay, so lambda Z is minus 1, and we've got this. And here's the three-dimensional plot. Okay. Now this says the particle has negative angular momentum about the about the vertical axis of rotation. So of course the particle is going to move out this in this direction in the um, in the uh, clockwise direction. But of course the, as it gets closer to the um, black hole itself, the rotation is so strong that it has to rotate with the black hole itself. It can't. And especially as it approaches the stationary limit surface, which is actually about two units in this case here for A is 0 0.8, it's about two units, or it's exactly two units. Um, it has to rotate with it as it gets closer. So even though it has ang negative angular momentum and wants to rotate in a clockwise direction about the black hole, the black hole in all these cases has um, A is plus 0 0.8, so it's rotating counterclockwise. Well, the closer it gets, there's a point where it just can't uh, rotate against the rotation of the black hole, so it must go with it. You can see that here as well. It's coming out here, wants to go down the page, but it can't. It's trapped. The rotation of the black hole draws it around. All right, next one, uh, stronger angular momentum, minus 2.5 units. You can see it wants to go, but it can't, especially near the stationary limit surface, which is that point here. That's two units just here. It has to, anything, once it crosses that stationary limit surface, it has to rotate with the black hole. There's absolutely no choice. And, and even before it gets to the stationary limit surface, it's being drawn in in the direction of rotation. You can see right here. I think I've got one more example of that. Oh, yes, I have, yes. So here's even very, even more negative. So it's, it's even more negative. The particle a little ma of mass, little m, has even more uh, negative uh, angular momentum wants to rotate clockwise around the black hole, which is rotating anti-clockwise. And of course, the black hole's not going to let it do that. It's going to, as it's drawn in by the um, curvature of the space time, you can see that it must rotate with the black hole. It's got no choice. 
it's pulled in round and then eventually it crosses the event horizon. Okay, uh, and this is, I was talking about earlier, you can get kappa in each of these cases by writing lambda z minus a times epsilon all squared and it will calculate the value of kappa for you. For the previous ones, I've just been putting in kappa as 12. See, 12, 12, okay, 12. Um, but here's the general rule, you can work this way and get it. Okay, it's a beautiful piece though here. This is in the equatorial plane. You can see here, but you see it, it can't rotate against the rotation of the black hole, no matter how much angular momentum you're going to give it. Okay, um, now here's another um, deflection orbit, scattering orbit if you like. Okay, lambda z is plus three, so it's rotating in the same direction as the black hole. Uh, and you can see it starts here in the equatorial plane. If we project it onto the x, y axis, it goes like this. Okay, so it starts here, goes around like that. So it's starting here and shooting around like that. Scattering. Let's try another one. Plus 2.8. What do I have there? I had plus 3, so let's reduce it to plus 2.8. And here I go. Here it goes around there, so there. Next one, plus two, reduce it again, plus 2.5, starts here. You can see what's happening. The orbit's been shifted around. Uh, plus two, reduce it again, so here it goes. Down there, here we go, like that. And 1.5, now 1.5, we're getting into the realm of a plunge orbit now. Round it goes. Details of what type of orbits can be found in the paper, but I didn't go through that because we'd be here longer to go through it all. Uh, you'll, you'll need to read it for yourself, but you can just play around with trying different values. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to do. Uh, another plunge orbit here, like that. In it goes. More plunge orbits, just reducing the value 0.5. Next one, I'll reduce it to zero. Particle now has got no angular momentum, so it just comes just pretty well in a straight line, straight in. It's only the rotation of the um, outer stationary limit which pulls it around and curves the orbit at that point there. But other than that, it's just falling straight in. Almost a radial path until it gets close and then the uh, twisting in the space time around the black hole bends the path. So it ceases to be purely radial. Uh, we start working with negative values, comes in like this, but in the end, it just gets corrected and dragged around. Minus one, same thing again, it, just, it can't go against the rotation of the black hole, it just gets dragged in. Minus 1.5, same thing, just gets dragged in. We've got minus two, yeah, it just gets dragged in, it's got no choice. Nothing can rotate against the black hole once it crosses that stationary limit surface. Uh, and then that's it.